my kids have a different internet than I did. It's mutated to something that I don't fully recognize anymore. Like when someone first explained to me the concept of cyberbullying, as somebody who was bullied in the real world, I was like, aww. <laughs> mm, I'm so sorry about that. That sounds so hard for you. All those nasty words online. And then I started posting content on the internet and I was like, no, this is way worse. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, they're so mean on here. I hate this so much. They keep telling me that I'm an uglier, less funny Ned Flanders. I hate this, I hate this. I would way rather get punched in the face than this. I want to set the tone up real quick before we go. The answer is yes. We did borrow this, these curtains from a local church. We did. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, we did. Uh, what I'm saying is that puppets have come from behind them before <laughs> at a local vacation Bible school <laughs> in the Dallas area, so. This means a lot to me that you guys are here, genuinely. I, uh, it's been a tough couple of years, you know? We've all been getting through in our different ways. I took up a new hobby. I started uh, grinding my teeth, huh? <laughs> Any grinders in the house tonight? Anywhere? Yes, be proud like that. You raise your mouth guard in the air. You celebrate that your subconscious attacks you during your rest time. That's healthy, right? You don't need to talk to anybody about that. Just drink and pray that away. You'll be all right. No, I went to the dentist for a root canal. And he goes, hey, looks like you've been grinding your teeth. I was like, all right, cool, 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 cool. Um, what usually causes that? And he goes, well, it's usually caused by stress. And then unironically, he goes, is there anything in your life or the world around you recently that may have increased your stress levels? I was like, I mean, are we doing this for real? How about everything, every single thing, everything that I read, every app on my phone, every relationship in my life, every thought, every dream. I'm in the middle of a root canal. This is the most relaxed I've been in two years. <laughs> Hardest part for me was the school closures, all right? So I have three kids, and where I live, the schools are closed for 13 months. And when we got the letter from the school district that they were finally returning to in-person school, I recommitted my life to Christ. <laughs> I was like, you put me through a lot, Lord, but I'm back, I'm back. <laughs> the letter's like, unfortunately, they still have to wear the mask. I was like, do you think I care about the mask? <laughs> After 13 months, they can wear just masks for all I care. <laughs> Get them out of my home. I told my son, I was like, listen, I will take you to school. Someone else is gonna have to come get you or I'm gonna get a DUI in the pickup line. <laughs> Mom and I are gonna start drinking the second that you leave. Full disclosure, I'll take the DUI. I could use the night away, honestly. <laughs> I feel for my daughter the most during that, my youngest daughter. She, she has some real struggles during that time. Uh, one is that uh, during that time, I was in charge of her education. Yeah, and that sucks for her. Uh, I have very limited teaching abilities. I know everything that a first grader knows, not to flex on you guys like that, but... <laughs> I don't know how to teach it to them because I'm not a teacher. I don't have the superpower that teachers have, which is they can take what an adult knows and give that to a child. I don't know how to do that. I wish I did, because you know what you learn in first grade? How to read. <laughs> Pretty big life skill, that one. And we were three weeks into Zoom school. I was like, ah, you just might not learn this. You might be <laughs> one of those can't read kids. Sorry, sweetie. It was also hard for her because she has bad anxiety. And we're trying to be modern, progressive parents. We're trying to meet her needs. We're in therapy, but I also got some old school in me, you know? I like playing rough with my kids. I like giving them noogies and Charlie horses and indigenous people burns. There's just a generational gap 
that I can't fully empathize with what she's going through. Like she recently, went after therapy, she said to me one time, she's like, hey daddy, did you ever do therapy when you were a kid? I was like, oh honey, no. Therapy, I couldn't tell my dad I was thirsty. We weren't doing things like communicating emotional vulnerabilities. No, we were doing things like hiding injuries so we didn't get in trouble. That's what we were doing. I remember one time when I was a kid, me and my friend Tommy were playing in the ravine. You were never allowed in ravines when I was a kid, all right? Kids got kidnapped in ravines like every single day of the 1990s. And Tommy fell down and got a cut that was clearly from there. He's like, dude, I can't go home, man. I can't go home. I'm gonna be in so much trouble. You gotta help me out. You gotta stitch me up. I was like, stitch you up? Tommy, I'm wearing Velcro because I can't tie my shoes right now. I don't have the fine motor skills required <laughs> for this medical procedure, unfortunately. And then it just hit him. He's like, I guess I just live in the ravine now. <laughs> that happens though. Parenting changes a lot every generation. My dad always wanted me to be this like super tough guy. And I was like, ah, sorry dad, I got allergies. <laughs> you can't be tough with allergies. It's impossible. Somebody wants to start a fight. Hey buddy, let's take this outside. Uh-uh, not outside. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, no. In spring with this cross breeze? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> I don't know. My daughter's doing great in therapy, though. She's honest, she's vulnerable, we're making progress. And she's funny. She crushes in therapy. Like, she has a good set most weeks. She told the therapist, the therapist found out that sometimes when her anxiety is too bad, she'll go under her desk and kind of hide from everything. And she told the therapist, she goes, I know it's not good that I go under my desk, but the good news is while I'm down there, I'm always ready for an earthquake. <laughs> Which is a pretty great line from an illiterate seven-year-old. <laughs> and she was laughing and I was laughing and the therapist interrupted and goes, hey, it seems like your daughter might be using humor. <laughs> to mask some deep-seated problems we should probably deal with. I go, you shut your shrink mouth. That is not the issue. That's never been an issue with anyone any time ever, all right? But if that was the issue, how do we deal with that? <laughs> is that like a forgiveness thing? What are we doing here? I'd say that's one of the hardest parts about parenting, when you see your stuff in your kids. Teacher pulled us aside one day, this is when I knew we needed some therapy for our daughter. She said, hey, I just wanna let you know, your daughter spends a lot of the afternoon crying. I was like, yeah, that runs in the family. <laughs> that is a learned behavior right there. That is nature and nurture is what that is. Like one of my kids has ADD, that's my bad. Um, I, you know, I hot potato that one along nicely. And then my youngest daughter, she's the one in therapy, she recently got diagnosed with a thing called ODD. It's Oppositional Defiance Order. It's a real thing, all right? The basic idea is somebody tells you to do something that you don't wanna do, and it feels like your whole body gets set on fire, and then you wanna murder the person that told you that. And I was like, that one she gets from her mom. That one, <laughs> that one I am well-versed in, thank you. I'm pretty sure that is what our wedding vows were right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel for my kids because my kids will never know a world, a world without social media. And social media is so aggressive. People are so focused on their differences. Like even friends, like I had lunch with a friend recently that I grew up with, but I hadn't seen in a long time. And we sat down and he goes, hey man, just out of curiosity, what do you think about guns these days? <laughs> that was his hello. I was like, come on, man, you know me. We grew up together. I grew up redneck. We had guns around and stuff, but I just don't like, like really like them. They're not really fun for me. And he got super aggressive and defensive. He goes, but what about to protect your home? I go, buddy, I'm a millennial. I don't own a home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, do you think I'm gonna be a hero for my landlord? <laughs> I've been trying to get a new sink from this guy for seven years. I'm not looking to murder on his behalf. I actually love being a renter. I love the freedom of being a renter. Something breaks in your house, someone's like, hey man, your toilet's broken. You're like, my toilet, is it broken? Andre's toilet is broken. 
But people own homes, they always try to make you feel bad. You know, you're just wasting your money. You're just wasting your money, all right? You're just throwing that money into a hole. You're like, well, maybe, but I'm gonna throw my whole body into a hole in 40 years. So, <laughs> it can get there first and warm it up for me. How about that? But don't feel bad for me. I'm actually doing pretty well financially. I'll prove it. I got two kids in braces. I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah. That's about as good as it gets for a comedian right there. Yeah. The jokes close that gap. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. <laughs> I, don't know. I, would, I don't like arguing online and stuff, too, because I, I don't know, man. I run stress. The lockdown really revealed that to me because uh, I was locked in my house, and I was like, man, I hate this. And then everything opened back up, and I was like, yeah, I hate this, too. <laughs> this is a me issue. I understand that now. It was revealed to me because what happened was uh, the first thing, when things opened back up, the first thing that I did is I went into public and I yelled at a Panera Bread employee <laughs> because they wouldn't serve me oatmeal. <laughs> and I'm 37 and oatmeal's a pretty big part of my life. <laughs> I look forward to oatmeal when I go to bed at night. It's what I'm thinking about. Oh, morning, get coffee and oats. Get those oats in my belly. <laughs> can't wait. I got different recipes for the different days. Chopped apples, frozen blueberries. Love it so much. Wait a minute. Tomorrow is Saturday. Saturday is cheat day. It's still oatmeal, but I get to put pecans in it, and that's the fatty nut, right? <laughs> so I went to go get some Panera oatmeal, because that's my favorite oatmeal, and they wouldn't serve me oatmeal because it was afternoon, and they're like, I'm sorry. We can't serve you oatmeal afternoon. I lost my mind. I looked at him. I was like, I'm not asking for a lot right now. You can do this. I know you can. I know you have the ability to do this. This isn't some old family recipe <laughs> passed down from generation to generation. There's no skills to this one right here. Did your hot water guy go home? Nobody on the premises with this skill right here? Okay, I changed my order. Instead of that, I'll take a hot tea, hold the tea, add oats. Can we do that? <laughs> Give me those oats, baby. <laughs> I know what it is. I don't trust people like to act normally in public because I fly too much. And people just, they're weird in the clouds, man. <laughs> people do the most clearly socially unacceptable stuff on planes. It's so weird. I was on a flight recently and there was a couple that had two aisle seats and they were holding hands across the aisle. <laughs> Which, no, you cannot do that in a functioning democracy. What are you doing? It wasn't even a takeoff or landing. I'll give you a takeoff or landing. It gets a little spooky. I'll give you that. It was in the middle of the flight. I was like, what are you doing? There's commerce that needs to happen right now. The selfishness of this decision. I got so angry. I took one for the team. I went full Red Rover. I came on over. I did have my favorite thing happen recently on a flight. I was flying from where I'm from in Seattle to where I live in San Diego, all right? It's about a two and a half hour flight. And the girl next to me got out a journal and I was like, well, this has my full attention. <laughs> and then she wrote at the top of the list, things to do before 40, and she underlined it. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I cannot wait to see this list so that I can judge this person for their dreams and ambitions. <laughs> I'm so excited to see this list. And the first thing that she wrote on there was to rescue a dog. And I was like, all right, that's a good one. <laughs> the second thing that she wrote on the list was to live overseas. And I was like, oh my, like that's, who's gonna watch the dog? <laughs> You're a bad planner, you know? And the third one was to own a home by the ocean. I was like, you are ambitious because you are currently in the middle seat of a Southwest flight. <laughs> You're really trying to climb the ladder right now. You're trying to go from boarding group C to a home by the sea. Incredible, all right? And I was really rooting for her at that point. I wanted her to make it. And then she took out her phone to take a picture of the list and the phone was an Android. I'm like, oh, you'll never make it, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're too far behind, I'm sorry. God doesn't hear the prayers of green bubbles, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I know the source of my stress. It's uh, my house. I got a very packed house. I'm married. She lives with me. <laughs> my dad lives with us. Uh, three kids constantly trying to navigate these hard decisions all the time. Trying to figure out what age you got to stop letting your kids see you naked. <laughs> Because I think I need to have a talk with my dad. It is. <laughs> I don't know how many Christmases in a row I have to get you a robe before <laughs> you get the clue that I don't like these daily glimpses into the future. No, I'm really close to my dad. Really, really close to my dad. Because I was raised by a single dad. Uh, we were raised poor, not fake poor, legit poor. I hate when people act like they grew up poor, but you know them, so you know better. They're like, I grew up poor. You're like, mm, you know how to ski. <laughs> I don't believe you. Ray's redneck. My dad is from this small little rural town in Oregon. If you don't know this about Oregon, as soon as you get outside of Portland, it gets super conservative, super rednecky, very fat. Like they fly Confederate flags and stuff, and you're like, I mean, Oregon wasn't in that war. <laughs> I guess. I guess if you just don't have a home team, you just got to pick one. I guess. I mean, we were super rednecky. We would get together once a year at a family reunion that was centered over a horseshoe tournament that I would usually win as a child because I was the most sober. And of course, not sober, just the most sober, you know? <laughs> My favorite thing though, like about being raised redneck, there was challenges though, because I wasn't raised in a redneck area. I was raised in Seattle and Seattle is the opposite of redneck. Very progressive, very left, very liberal, you know, but I, you don't know your home's different until you start mixing groups. Mine was my first sleepover. My friends come over and they're like, hey, Dustin, we're gonna stay up late and we're gonna go in the bathroom, we'll look in the mirror and we're gonna say Bloody Mary three times and Bloody Mary's gonna come out at night. I'm a little second grader like, uh, no, Bloody Mary's come out in the morning, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're drinking Bloody Marys at night? <laughs> Do you have no class or sophistication? I mean, I can make you one in the morning. I know how, I'm a good son. You know, it's the only reason we have celery in this house. <laughs> My favorite thing about being raised redneck though is I have a firm appreciation for rednecks, a firm appreciation. My favorite thing about rednecks is they never panic. Even in situations they should absolutely panic. <laughs> I remember one time my cousin Tater, real name, Tater. Uh, Tater crashed his brand new Dodge Ram into a tree because he was drunk driving, or as my family calls it, driving at night. <laughs> and we're like, Tater, you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. That truck is gone. You're screwed. And he didn't panic. He didn't call the insurance company. And he didn't call the cops. The first thing that he did was go down to the butcher shop and get some venison, which is deer meat for any of you Californians that moved to Texas. <laughs> And he took the deer meat and he put it in the grill of his truck where there were dents, all right? And he took it, like broke off little pieces, the whole thing. Squeezed it out so there would be blood spots. Cut some hair off of his dog. Put those on the sticky blood spots. Call, then he called the insurance company and the cops said, no, 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 I didn't hit a tree. I hit this deer that just came out of nowhere. Two weeks later, he had a settlement check for 30 grand to buy a brand new Dodge Ram. And I'm 11 years old going, why aren't they teaching this in the schools? <laughs> this is the most valuable information I have learned to date. This should be the D.A.R.E. program. That's what this should be. I'm this man's disciple. I'm Tater's Ta. I will follow him. <laughs> so I was raised redneck. I was also raised trashy. Uh... <laughs> I didn't know I was raised trashy though because our neighbors were trashier. Uh, how did I know? The meth, that was the big giveaway. Uh, so much meth, so much more than you're supposed to have. So much, way above meth quota. 
But it wasn't all bad, the Methy neighbors. Uh, they had an older sister named Tabby, and uh, she was like 16 when I was 12. And one time she stole my sister's dress, and my sister's like, hey, I need you to get that dress back. I was like, hey, I'm not crazy about this assignment because her nickname in school is Stabby Tabby. <laughs> And I kind of avoid confrontation as well, but I'm also terrified of you, so off to my death. Here we go. <laughs> so I go over there and I knock on the door and Tabby answers the door and she's wearing my sister's dress. And I'm like, kind of like sheepish and like, hey, uh, Tabby, Stabby, I don't know who you go by in your home. Uh, is it more formal, Stabatha? I don't know who you go by. <laughs> But is there any way, please, in under, please, can I get that dress back from my sisters? I don't know if it's because I was young or she was just tired of dealing with it, but she decided to relent and she just took off the dress and she had nothing on underneath. And I had never seen a naked girl in person before. And I was like, well, this ended up being one of the better days of my youth. <laughs> this story really took a turn for old Dusty, didn't. Because not only did I see my first naked girl, I got the dress back, so I came, I got like a hero's welcome. <laughs> Parades in the street, they're like, you did it, Dustin, you got the dress back, you're a hero. I was like, I am a hero, absolutely. Also, do any of your other friends have dresses you need back? My immaturity is becoming an issue right now because my kids are getting older and I'm not like mature enough to raise high schoolers. My son's in high school and we went to his freshman orientation and uh, we showed this video of this kid that got expelled because he like skateboarded through the hallway, tagged the locker rooms, flipped off the cameras and I like fist bumped my son. I was like, dude, this kid rules. <laughs> this kid is awesome right here, all right? Don't be him, but get to know him, you know? He's a bad example, but I bet a great hang, a good time, you know? <laughs> it's good when you come to grips with your immaturity, though. I know that, uh, that's why I have no hot political takes. I'm too immature, too immature for any hot political takes. Uh, I know that because anytime something happens to the Supreme Court and they talk about it in writing and they abbreviate it to SCOTUS, <laughs> I giggle, because that looks like scrotum. <laughs> and, <laughs> And you just don't get to say anything at that point. If that makes you giggle, you're out. You're out. <laughs> I'm also tired. All the hot takes are about the people in charge. And no one's talking about us, the American people. Regardless of how you voted and what you... That's like, what a shift we're all feeling, man. From Trump to Biden, that whiplash we're all feeling right there. <laughs> Going from cocaine to Ambien, just like that. <laughs> oh. Can I get a breather, a breather? <laughs> I think that was Trump's only miscalculation is when he called Biden Sleepy Joe. I don't think he realized that half the country is like, Don, I need a nap. I do. <laughs> I'm so tired. I need exactly what his energy is, which is just a substitute teacher that puts on a movie. That's what I need. <laughs> I gotta sit a play out, Don, I'm sorry. I try really hard to find political stories that you can knight us all. Uh, there's two. <laughs> now keep in mind as I'm discussing these that your politics are like your children. I don't care about them. <laughs> but I want you to care about yours. It's just not for me. When people go on and on and on, I'm just like, I'm not, I don't think I'm supposed to hear this. Is this it's like one of my, my daughter's dance recital and a kid other than mine is up there. No. <laughs> I'm not into this. It'd be weird if I was too into it. <laughs> With this mustache, I'm lucky I'm on campus right now. <laughs> so there are two stories that unite us. One, I'm a girl dad, all right? I have two daughters. So when we got a female VP, that's a nice assist for girl dads because we're always looking for talking points to empower our daughters. So I looked at my daughter, I go, this is a historic moment, highest ranking female we've ever had in government. Believe in your dreams. Do not limit yourself in any way whatsoever. And then my other daughter looked at me, the one who I've been in charge of her education for 18 months. <laughs> she looked at me, she's like, what about me, daddy? And I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, it is not a wide open playing field for you anymore. <laughs> I've done too much damage, that's on me. I've seen that report card before and that is stand-up comedian or real estate agent. Those are... <laughs> Either way, you're gonna need a good headshot. Either way. <laughs> 
That's one of the more challenging parts of parenting. When are you going to be brutally honest with your kids about their skills and their abilities, stuff like that, you know? Small things, too. Their art. When are you going to be real with the kid about their art? <laughs> when they're young, anything they bring you, you're like, oh, my little Picasso, so good. As they get older, you're like, you wanted me to see this? Can I put it on the fridge? You can put that under the fridge. <laughs> you got to try sports. This is a bad route for you. I know I'm bad at art because I had a teacher tell me I was bad at art. Yeah, second grade, Miss Higley. We were making portraits of MLK and mine was so bad that Miss Higley pulled me aside and said she wasn't going to hang out with the other kids <laughs> because she feared and I quote, it was potentially dishonoring <laughs> to the legacy of MLK. <laughs> I was like, message received, Miss Higley. I'll put the crayon down so I don't undo the civil rights movement. I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was racist bad. I guess I got more tater in me than I realized. <laughs> okay. So that's one story that unites us. The other one, uh, this, uh, this unites us because it applies to both presidencies, is I miss something. Uh, what I miss is I miss the presidential fitness test meaning something. <laughs> Once upon a time, you would take a week out of PE. You would run the mile, you would do some pull-ups, you would do some sit-ups, you would do a stretch, and then you would do the shuttle run. Remember that one right there? That important life skill, just in case there were ever erasers 20 feet apart in your life that you needed to quickly redistribute that skill right there. And if you got in the top 20th percentile of each of those tests, you got a letter from the president congratulating you on your health and your athletic endeavors. That letter coming from Trump or Biden? Those specimens of fitness and health? Not exactly inspirational, right? That's like getting an Oscar from Shaq. That doesn't mean anything. But it used to, our presidents used to be athletes. Brock was an athlete. You see that guy's jump shot? That's an athlete right there. W, W could throw an 80 mile per hour fastball, dodge a shoe, that's a jock right there. Clinton, Clinton had a gut, but he was getting plenty of exercise. He was. He's keeping his heart rate up. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Part of the reason I would never judge anyone's politics is because uh, for my life to go the way I want it to go, I do need both parties in my life. I do. I'm not a Republican, but I want my tax guy to be a Republican. And not a little, a lot Republican. I want some shady GOP tax stuff done on my behalf. Way right. I want him to have stormed the Capitol, ideally. There's no such thing as too far right for my tax guy. I want a CPA and a QAnon. Way right, way right. But that's my taxes. I wouldn't let a Republican touch my coffee. Oh, oh. Liberals make better coffee. I'm sorry to tell you this. Conservatives make terrible coffee. They're gonna call it espresso. Oh, no, no. Just different skills, you know? <laughs> I don't like extremes. There was a liberal tipping point for me growing up in Seattle that was too far from me, and that was uh, the Naked Bike Parade. <laughs> naked Bike Parade is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, a bunch of people get naked, and then they go ride bikes, and it sounds like something you might want to see, and then you see who does it, and you're like, I didn't want any part of this. <laughs> so many SCOTUSes, so many. <laughs> I did see one thing uh, that was really funny one time in the Naked Bike Parade, though. For years, me and my wife kept getting caught in the traffic of it, which sucks, because that's like right at eye level, you know? <laughs> and you would see him coming in the mirror like, no, <laughs> not again. <laughs> but one year, the group passed us and we're like, finally. And then there was a straggler. <laughs> there was a guy that fell behind. And I was like, oh man, if there's ever one group you don't want to get separated from, <laughs> It's the Naked Bike Parade. <laughs> Together, that's like a community statement, you know? By yourself, that's a crime. That is a crime. <laughs> huh. 
The other reason I really get too worked up politically is I feel like I got enough going on, all right? I'm married, I got kids, I work for 50 minutes a night, I'm slammed. I can't, I can't get caught up in all that noise. I got married really young too, I was 19 when I got married. Yeah, and a lot of time when you tell people that, they go, Jesus! And yeah, that's why. <laughs> we were rule followers and we were eager. Um, But I would never judge anybody's lifestyle. Like, if you guys didn't wait till marriage, what do I care that you want to go to hell? You know, that's... <laughs> you know, two minutes for eternity. Good choice, good choice. You think that was a hot night? Wait till you meet the devil. <laughs> I like being married, though. Uh, I like it a lot, uh, though there are awkward situations in a relationship, you know? To me, the best example of that is if my wife wants to go shopping at Victoria's Secret, uh, I can't really go with her, you know? Because there's nowhere for me to look <laughs> without weirding people out, you know? <laughs> like, the last time she went, I was like, listen, honey, I'm glad you're going. I support the product, but I don't... Normally, we just do yoga pants, which is Christian lingerie, but... <laughs> I don't want to go with you because there's nowhere for me to put my eyes. I can't look at anything. I can't look at the posters. I can't look at the other shoppers. I can't look at the mannequins. Mannequins might be the worst one, actually. <laughs> Just admiring them for too long. Oh, boobs, no head. That's how I like women. I like that. <laughs> I can't even look at my own wife. Look, as she holds up her eye, I'm like, yeah, I like that. Hey. <laughs> Daddy can't wait to see that later. Arr, 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 arr. <laughs> You know what, I'm gonna do something less awkward and just go breathe heavy in the corner. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> That's gonna put more people at ease, actually. <laughs> nah, that life's way behind us, man. 18 years, we're not doing lingerie anymore. You don't wrap a present when you know what it is. not doing that. That's, that. that's amateur stuff. Are you kidding me? No way, man. We don't get back to the hotel room and she's wearing lingerie. We get back and she's wearing Spanx that I help shake her out of, you know? <laughs> that's a professional relationship right there. That's real love right here, you know? <laughs> There's a true story. Recently, I'm shaking Mel out of her Spanx and... <laughs> And actually, we had this like moment where I realized how much she's absolutely the one for me because she looks up and she goes, you better talk about this on stage. <laughs> I was like, you know I will, honey. You know I will. Now quit squirming. <laughs> I really feel for my wife and all the outfit stuff. That's a challenge. I don't know that world at all, you know? I'm always learning new things. We, went to, we were on a date recently. And I was like, hey, I'm gonna go pee. Do you need to go? And she's like, yeah, I do need to go. But I'm not gonna go because I'm wearing this romper and it's not a great pee outfit. I go, honey, I literally don't understand what you just said. Did you have a stroke mid-sentence? Those words don't compute in any language I've ever heard. What are you talking about? She's like, it's all connected. She was like, what? I was like, go pee. I pretty much have to get full nude. I was like, is that what's going on in there? I had no idea, because every outfit I've ever worn has been a great pee outfit, all of them. <laughs> Sometimes there's a belt, that's a little obstacle, but not really. You're getting full nude. If I'm full nude going pee, I'm in the shower. <laughs> I like when you married for a long time, the honesty that comes in a relationship, you know? Like I remember uh, when I first started working the road, I said to my wife, I was like, hey honey, I'm faithful. I'm always gonna be faithful. You don't need to worry about me. And her response was, oh, I never did. <laughs> but she's not being mean, she just knows me. She knows I don't really have cheat energy. I don't put that out into the world. No, I've never looked at my naked body and be like, yeah, who wants to see this, huh? Who wants to know that hair can go right there, right there?
One uh, interesting part about being married is I'm in an industry full of single guys. A lot of single guys in comedy. And single guys and married guys were just not on the same page anymore. <laughs> Different lives, man. I had a guy who was opening for me recently. We went back to my hotel room afterwards to have a couple beers and watch a game. And he went into my bathroom and he saw some white powder. And he's like, dude, are you getting crazy in here? Are you getting wild? I was like, I'm sorry, do you think that's cocaine? <laughs> Buddy, that's gold bond. <laughs> We're not getting wild out of here. I'm just trying to absorb some moisture. I got a very different kind of itch I'm dealing with. Single guys always want to talk shop too. He's always like, dude, you and your wife ever get a little naughty in the text thread, huh? You guys ever send some naughty pictures? They're like, I'm sorry, are you asking if we send nudes? No, absolutely not. If I send a picture of skin to my wife, it's like, is that a rash? What do you see back there? Does that look infected? I can't see it, I can't. Can you upload that to the doctor? I, I forgot my password. <laughs> send nudes. No, we don't send nudes. This whole thread syncs with a kid's iPad. They see this. <laughs> that would really ruin that episode of Bubble Guppies, you know? <laughs> it's time for lunch. Oh, no, no. I had one single guy friend, he always wants to talk shop and he wants to talk about feet. I had to cut him off, I was like, dude, no. No, 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 that is not like a married for a long time thing. I don't, near my mouth, oh my gosh, no. Bro, we don't clean our floors. Oh, 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 oh I know too much, man. I see the chores list, that hasn't been checked in weeks. Uh, oh, I'm not trying to have some hot night with my wife and catch a Cheerio, oh, oh, oh. Oh my gosh, did you splurge on Honey Nut? We can't afford that. <laughs> I don't know, it's challenges to every uh, season of life. I've realized that. My, uh, my son is old now, he's in high school, and uh, he's very cool, which I did not see coming. <laughs> Just based on the ingredients we gave him. He's very cool, very cool. Like he has great hair, you know. He skateboards and he plays football. Nobody does both those things. <laughs> Sometimes I look at it and I'm like, hmm, mom might have cheated. She might have. <laughs> but he's so cool, it's worth it. I don't even mind, don't even mind. I'm just honored to be a part of your journey. I'll step dad you all day. <laughs> Hardest part about your kids getting older is they stay up late. That's a real challenge, you know? You're trying to keep that spark alive in the bedroom. That happens late at night. I had to have a very honest, very frank conversation with my son recently. He's like, dad, can I stay up late tonight? I was like, I mean. You could stay up late. <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> if you wanna milk that little bit of childhood that you have left, I recommend you retreat to your quarters. Cause the fan can only get so loud. question that every parent gets that I hate. People ask if you have a favorite kid. You don't have a favorite kid. You have a kid that you enjoy their company the most. <laughs> and for me, it's, uh, it's my middle kid, uh, Gloria. We just get along a lot. We're the same person. She has ADD, like me. Uh, it's a good time. We have a blast. She officially got diagnosed recently. They go in, they do a three-hour test. If you finish the test, you don't have ADD. <laughs> But parenting ADD when you have ADD is a challenge. I admit that. They like handed me this like 30 page pamphlet on how to raise a child with ADD. I was like, ah, you know I'm not reading this. <laughs> nah, you gotta give me this information in some other format. Is there like a VR experience we can do? Or a series of instructional TikToks? How about that, dad? <laughs> but she's like me and that uh, her and I, we have two emotions. Gloria and I, we have two emotions. We have chill and we have rage. <laughs> Chill, she's a lot of fun. She's exactly how I've been here with you guys tonight so far. She's very smiley, she's good energy. She's also pretty funny. With the dinner table recently, we're having salad for dinner. Out of nowhere, she takes the dressing and to the tune of David Bowie's song, Let's Dance, she takes the dressing and she goes, let's wrench. <laughs> 
And I go, that's unbelievable what you just did right there. Did you just do a Bowie themed dad joke about this specific meal? I take it back. I do have a favorite. I do. <laughs> but she's also mean. She's got that rage. She is like mean, mean. She'll bring out sides of me I didn't know I had, you know? Like I've never hit my daughter, but I have thrown a Hawaiian sweet roll at her. I have. <laughs> She's that level of mean that if one of the parents is yelling at her, the other parent won't stop that parent. If anything, they'll get hyped like, get her, get her! She needs to hear this. But my daughter is specifically mean to my wife. She's really targeting my wife. And that's crazy to watch, man, you know? Your child be that mean to your spouse? This is my high school sweetheart. We've been together for 20 years. And the things you just say to my wife, I'll just sit there with my mouth open like, oh my gosh. I have always wanted to talk to her like that. I... No, you're in trouble, but finish your thought. Finish your thought. All right, Dallas, you're a lot of fun. I've been Dustin Nickerson. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It really means a lot to me that you guys came out tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is hilarious. What a good moment. Uh, don't keep this in. What was the second joke? Was it was first, it was a rescue dog, and the second. Uh, wow, what a funny time to blank. Uh, for rescue dog. This, this is some behind the scenes stuff right here, baby. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Alec, those jokes that missed up top, put that applause break up there. That's. 